So the virtue that we're going to be reflecting on today is called the virtue of justice. The virtue of justice is something that I think all of us have all heard on, especially us who are of the Christian denominations, largely because like we know social justice is a large part of what we do. Now, although social justice, which is something that is very deep within our tradition, is something that's well known, justice is actually much more broad and substantial uh, than just that one part of our social teachings. Uh, we do have exemplaries of this virtue of justice that we've really lifted up, in particular the Catholic Worker Movement, with Peter Marin and Dorothy Day, who started um, the Dorothy Day Centers and whatnot, that really serve incredible ways uh, to the poor and the homeless. In fact, throughout the world, right, uh, the, the, the Christians' denominations have some of the most amazing ministries to those who are disenfranchised. And so the social justice piece is so important, but in order for us to understand how overarching that virtue of justice is, we really have to go back to some of the foundational definition of what justice is. Justice literally comes from a Latin word, uh, J-U-S, which simply means right, R-I-G-H-T. Now, the reason why is justice is defined by if it is right or not. So it has to be ordered to, to right reason, and it is exactly what is due. It is not just about a social situation. This is why the term social justice is actually just a branch of justice. It doesn't encompass all of it. It means that we are in right relationship. All right. This is why justice, use, right. We are in right relationship with God, with ourselves, and with society as a whole. Those are the kind of the three major areas. Thomas Aquinas does a brilliant job of breaking justice into three categories. Communitive justice, which is basically it has to do with how we interact with one another basically kind of um, laws that would be in place. Then there's legal justice. Um, these are things that are ensuring that individuals in society live in a harmonious way. Then there's what's called distributive justice. Distributive justice is what um, we would see kind of that category of social justice. It has to do with how we as a society interact with one another. Now these three types of justice strive to order all of our relationships that we have in life in right order. This is why throughout the scriptures, one of the kind of highest praises that we can hear in both the Judeo and Christian um, traditions is, uh, it is, if you describe someone as a good person, you'd say they were a just man or just woman. And what this means is that they are in right order with everything. So there's really no fault that you can take with the individual. St. Joseph himself was called a just man for this exact reason, right? Is he was in right order with himself right order with God, and right order with society. The thing that is unique about justice among all the other virtues is that a lot of the other virtues are just about how we internally are doing and how our responsive will is. But justice actually makes us look on the outside to see, okay, even though I might be in right order with myself and with God, justice is saying, if I'm not actually advocating for justice around me, I'm actually lacking a part of that virtue. It is more with how we deal with one another and others. This is also why the virtue is usually something that, within the Christian tradition, is fine-tuned during what's called the illuminative phase of the spiritual progression. Because in this illuminative phase, it's where the lights are starting to come on, and people are actually able to see, oh my goodness, my life is about more than just myself. And this is where justice kind of starts to get illuminated, is we realize it's not just about getting what I want when I want it, but it's also making sure that society as a whole is actually ebbing and flowing in a right relationship with reason. Now, I remember right uh, coming across a need to grow in justice in regards to a communal living situation. Uh, I was assigned to a parish where I lived with another priest. Um, I'm definitely more of an extrovert, and I've realized that even more during these shelter-in-place days. And I was living with an introvert. So I would get back from ministry and I would be like, just talking a mile a minute and just be like, hey, what about this? What about this? What are you thinking about this? How about this project? And as the kind of months went on when I was living with this priest, I could see he was getting more and more frustrated whenever I would come home at night and would be kind of actually locking himself in his bedroom because he was just like, he needed time to just be alone and to decompress. So after a while and a couple of blow-ups, right, I realized that I was being unjust to this brother. I was putting my need to externally process and speak 
over his need to just reflect. So what justice would have looked like in that situation is kind of a give and a take. Is this brother would have recognized, hey, I need some time to process, so he would endure me sometimes. And then I would also come and be able to perceive how is this person doing, and injustice would give him his time to kind of have silent processing. Justice indeed is about giving others what is rightly due to them. But this also entails in that we human beings understand what it means to be in interaction with the other. One cannot exercise proper justice unless they understand who and what the human person is and their unique needs. This is why justice is always going to be a particular thing. Uh, you can't really brush in broad strokes of justice and this is why every court case is an individual court case. Yes, they'll use other cases to kind of show how they're evaluating the particular case, but every single case needs to be judged uniquely. Now, this is something that's actually very important as well, because there is the study of the human person, which is called anthropology, of basically what, is, what makes up the human person, where did the human person come from? When we as a society or as individuals are basically operating that different people have different value and worth, it's very hard to have a just society. And this is why if there is, you know, racism or prejudices that exist within a culture or a society, it's very hard to be just. Now, within the Catholic tradition, right, we have been very vocal about pro-life issues, both with abortion as well as euthanasia. And part of this, right, is because of the desire to move towards justice is to say that justice is not just for those who are functional members of society, but we also need to be with those who are most vulnerable, those who are on the tail ends, or the, the, the bookends of, of the human experience, which is conception and birth, all the way to the process of old age and death. If we say that we are indeed just people, but we don't universally extend justice to everyone in need, there is a lack of justice on our part. It is not just to particular divvy out just in who we feel deserves justice, but we actually have to determine what is a human being, and then we have to universally deal out justice. I remember interacting with this reality. I was um, on a retreat, and we were having one of our meals, and it was with you know, people from all different religious backgrounds. And there was a man at this retreat center that was from the Hindu culture in India. And he was sharing with us at table something that was almost disbelievable to me. I'd seen it touched in the movie um, Slumdog Millionaire, but he was talking about the um, reality that in India there is a class system. And if you are born into a class that has, like, called the, it's called the untouchables or the Brahmim or uh, the priestly class, you will interact and get certain rights that others won't get. So even though each person is a valuable person, they're seen as having different value because of what um, genetic line they come from. And I was just shocked because it's impossible to have a just society when just by your very birth there's a tiered system. If our understanding of the human person is off, then how we actually extend justice to others is also going to be off. It will not be fair. This is where possessing right reason or prudence is absolutely vital. So let me give you this example to show how incredibly important this is. If we go back into the Nazi regime in Germany, right? If you were to ask a Nazi, are we treating the Jews justly? They would have said yes, even though they were putting them to just terrible deaths and persecuting them. Well, the reason why they would have said, yes, we are being just to them is because they didn't see them as persons and they would have all these derogatory terms for them. So what we see, right, is the Nazis had in their mind that they were being just to the Jews, even though objectively we stand back and we're like, that's justice? That's terrible what you've done to those people. And so this is why prudence or right reason always has to govern how justice works, because it really isn't that much of a subjective experience. It's much more of you can actually look at how you're treating someone and say, no, you, you treated this person who is an Aryan very nice and this person who is a Jew very terribly. And yet they've done the exact same thing, but you've weighed what they've done differently. This is not justice. And this is why as soon as right reason is lost, an individual cannot be just. This is also where a society that focuses solely on productivity, a person is only valuable as much as they can produce, is actually very dangerous. 
Because basically what you're saying is I'm evaluating someone's worth as a human being by what they provide to society. Versus saying even if you've done nothing for society, you still have certain rights that are owed to you as a human being. Without taking into account the uniqueness of each situation and person, one cannot adequately ever give justice. Now, this is where actually the um, profession of being a lawyer or a judge is actually very noble. Because the entire role of a lawyer or a judge is to take every single case and to make sure that a person's rights are heard and protected. We cannot have any blanket judgments. We must always go to the particulars. Now, scriptures relate this reality quite regularly. Um, in the Old Testament, there's two passages I want to bring up. One is Leviticus 19.15. And it says, You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge. So again, that right reason. Then you have Proverbs 29.7. And Proverbs talks a lot about justice. And the Psalms actually do too. Proverbs 29.7 says, the righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. So already, you're kind of actually weighing if a person is just or not to others, no matter what their circumstances, really determines if they are good or bad people in the scriptural lens. What the scriptures so beautifully show is that when speaking about justice, it means that it's a virtue, that it's dead in the center and it's a habitual thing of where we're constantly used to using right reason. It doesn't have preferences. Now, this is why, actually, even within the pagan cultures, if you ever see Lady Justice, it's always depicted as a usually a woman who is blindfolded and is holding scales, and oftentimes with a sword as well. And so the symbolism behind this, right, is that justice is blind, that it doesn't have a partiality between what you look like or how much money you have. And, of course, the scales are weighing, okay, did you do good or did you do bad? How are we going to weigh your case? Justice has always been within our tradition connected with humility for this exact reason. Is it's, it's saying basically, I don't know best. So the just person is actually okay with saying, I don't know what's best. I, I actually got to get the details of the case. I can't make just a snap decision. I can't be prejudiced. I can't be harsh or, or hasty. I actually need to take in all of the details for situation. This is in contrast, right, to the proud person who says, nope, I've got the right perspective, and this is exactly how it's going to be, period. Well, they're not actually executing justice at this point, because they're not, like those scales, weighing the different things in a particular case. Thus, humility is actually essential for giving proper justice. This is where our Lord actually applies the beautiful, quote-unquote, golden rule that actually exists in almost every single major religion, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? You just see justice, right? right relationship. And it shows that there's a right relationship with God, us, and society. This really is at its core an amazing decree. Because each person receives their due when each person in society is understanding and evaluating others as well. Now another way to look at this is actually through an analogy. Let's say that a sports team is playing all for the same purpose, to win, to be victorious, right? But as inevitably happens on you know, many sports teams, right, is you have like the superstar or the person who's trying to build their career or get stats increased. And so like they're the ones that are not passing. Uh, they're the ones that are trying to do all the scoring. They're the ones that are trying to get all the media presence. And it just becomes all about them. This is where we have like the, the adage, there's no I in team. Justice, right, is all of us are working together for a common goal. This is analogously to society, right? is as soon as someone thinks, ah, it's all about me and my thing and my reputation and my perspective on things, then justice isn't really that possible. So what, the common, what is the common good that social justice should be aiming at? Here's what our Catholic social teaching says, and it's actually beautifully articulated. I'm going to read it in full. The common goal is happiness, and this is what it says. The common good entails nothing less than the building of a society in which each and every individual can achieve moral perfection and material welfare. Moral perfection and material welfare, which brings about happiness, right? Because we are actually able to have everything that we need. It's not saying that everything is equally distributed. 
And I think this is actually where sometimes this whole understanding of justice can kind of go awry as we think, okay, we got to give everyone the same thing across the board. That's actually not justice because once again, you're not evaluating each circumstance uniquely. So here, here's an example to show this, right? Let's say that um, the medical association comes out and says every single American can get only three prescriptions every year, no more, no less. Well, that doesn't work, right? Is there some people who will need no prescriptions. There are other people who will need 12, 13, 14, depending on what their ailment is. So to, to kind of say everyone gets three just doesn't make sense because it's not evaluating just the particulars that are needed. Or here's another one that's kind of more comical, right? Let's say that everyone in the world gets the exact same amount of food. Well, once again, that, that doesn't make any sense because every single person has different metabolic rates. Every person has different needs um, for what uh, nourishment they actually need. The NFL football player needs a lot more calories on a daily intake than a five-year-old you know, boy or girl. So to say that they all would get the same amount of food would actually make no logical sense. We have to evaluate every single circumstance very uniquely. Therefore, true social justice is exactly as the definition describes. It is building a society where moral perfection and material welfare can be present. This is the ideal. If everyone possessed the virtue of justice, society would work very beautifully because we'd be able to say, ah, you know what, I have more than I need, I'm gonna share it with you. When the person who has more than they need would say, oh my goodness, you need something, let me share it with you. But because there are unjust members in society, this is where we see like moral imperfections, right? And just a disintegration of the whole collective harmony of society or overall happiness. And thus a true striving for social justice is a striving for a life of virtue. As such a society would create an environment of justice. Keeping in mind that the value and dignity of each human person is respected and valued. This is what allows for justice to flourish, is every person is worth everything. Now, there are two vicious extremes to justice, just like every virtue. There's an excess and a deficiency. So you might be curious, like, what is the excess of justice called? It's actually called tyranny. Tyranny is the excess of justice, too much justice. And this is also um, articulated probably more in our layman terms as an insensibility to mercy. So someone who is tyrannical actually can never kind of tone back the justice to, to say, oh, you know what? That person's circumstances, I've weighed them, they need mercy more than just strict, yes, this is what they do, this is what they deserve. See, tyranny is a taking justice into an excess where there are no checks and balances. There's really no longer those scales, and there's definitely not a blindfold. The individual person is lost in total control and oppression prevail. Now, a sign of this vicious excess is a lack of empathy. If someone we encounter cannot put themselves in the other person's shoes, or is self-consumed with personal ego, trying to like make their own legacy or reputation, they have lost something vital to justice. Now, back in 2013, um, one of the very tyrannical leaders in Venezuela, uh, Hugo Chavez, passed away. And in looking at the legacy he led, right, he, a lot of what he was doing that made things so unjust is he had resources. Like, the country was so rich with natural resources, in particular oil. And yet it was one of the poorest countries in the entire world. And, and the reason for this, right, is those very, very few people were not putting themselves in the perspective of others who are literally selling their hair, their teeth, um, everything that they had just to be able to get food on the table. So you see, right, when there's tyranny involved, it is not a just society. That's the excess. Now the deficiency. Now this is, again, kind of an interesting thing, like a deficiency of justice. What is this called? It's called sub submissiveness. Now, this is essentially the inability to stand up for what is right and just when it, there is something that is needed to be standed up for. One who is in this vicious disposition of a lack of justice is one who would refuse to stand up for the needs of another. So what this would look like practically, right, is let's say you witness someone being bullied either at school or at the workplace, or even in just society in general, and you go, that's their issue, they can deal with it. See, that, that's a lack of justice. It's just a submissiveness that is not appropriate to right reason, where you're saying, that is a person, and you have to treat that person with fairness, and you're not. 
And so justice actually moves us, kind of underlaid with fortitude, to invoke right, what is just and owed to a particular person. It's also turning a blind eye. So the submissiveness is like kind of when you put like the blinders on inappropriately. So you're not like blindfolded, not weighing people as far as one's more valuable than the other. But you're just saying, you know what, I'm just, I'm not going to look. I don't, I don't want to see. I don't want to know. And therefore, I'll just be in this blissful ignorance. That's not justice. Justice is not ignorant, but it is in right relationship. And it sees what is all around so it can judge properly. Behaviors that undermine justice are like vicious behaviors that really, um, one of the, one, I'm sorry, one of the behaviors that basically destroys any possibility for justice, either in excess or deficiency, right? And it, it just decimates the ability for the virtue to exist is bearing false witness or lying. And the reason for, right, if justice is taking information and then weighing it, if someone is bearing false witness and lying, you're getting false information so the scales are weighed incorrectly. So without a truthful society or a truthful presentation, justice actually can't be present. And this is why it's so important that one does not lie. Uh, we see in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 13, this incredible circumstance where there are two elders in the community who basically um, commit perjury as they, they lie about a woman, Susanna, having an affair when she never did. And their lie almost put Susanna to death because people were gathering the information that they said wrongly and they were weighing it and said, nope, she committed a grave sin. She deserves to be put to death. But Daniel, right in this prophetic moment, sees that this is wrong judgment and that there are lies and falsehoods. And he actually gets these elders to convict themselves through basically not being able to collaborate, collaborate their stories. And in the end, they are subjected to the punishment and Susanna is set free. Um, I know in my own life, right, and I think kids just do this naturally, is they try to lie to protect themselves from injury or harm. And I remember one instance in particular, it was in sixth grade, and my teacher, Mrs. Peterson, uh, was at All Saints uh, Catholic School, and she, she was just a marvelous teacher. Um, so, so good uh, to me, and I was very needed in that um, kind of moral development of my character at that time in my life. And I remember both my buddy and I, um, we both kind of got into trouble. And so Mrs. Peterson stopped the class, and she didn't know who had kind of done it. She could have known, but she wanted us to admit to it. She's like, who did this? Silence, silence. And finally, my buddy's like, I did it. But he didn't convict me. He didn't say, like, Nate and I did it. He just said, no, I, I did it. It's my fault. So we had to go and sign the blue book, which was kind of like if you signed it three times, you got a letter written home, and it was really bad. And we were just terrified of the blue book. Well, as soon as he sat back down from signing the blue book, tears in his eyes, I said to him, that was stupid. If you wouldn't have said anything, you wouldn't have gotten caught. To which Mrs. Peterson was right behind me. And I had to sign the blue book twice to make sure that now that I realized not only did I do something wrong, but I also lied for it. And so my inability to tell the truth actually put all of the burden on my friend when it actually should have been a shared burden. And I actually needed to be rebuked for the wrong that I had done. I had hindered justice by actually um, withholding truth. Now, there are friends of justice, just as there are friends of other virtues. So um, virtues that kind of would go underneath justice. Now, one that's very interesting that we don't often think about as being an issue of justice is the virtue of religion. Yes, religion is actually a virtue. <laughs> and it means how much is owed or due to God. And so really what we are looking at when we put religion underneath justice is to say, okay, God has given us all things that we have. He's given us life, breath, our own well-being, or even maybe some of the hardships he's allowed to come into our life, but he's gotten us through them. Right religion, right justice, is saying, okay, God, you've given me this. What do you ask in exchange? And this is why actually, um, and this has been a really sobering reality for me and just kind of growing out of my own selfishness, is I always viewed like going to mass on Sundays as like, oh, man, fine, we got to do it, you know, but I, I want it to be good, all right? I want the music perfect. I want the preaching to be awesome. I want the community to be really engaging and warm and welcoming. And I want to walk away feeling uplifted. Well, after I've started studying the virtues, I'm like, well, you know what, that, that's a lot about me. So I should be able to go to Mass on Sunday and say it inconvenienced my schedule, I'm exhausted, or I'm on vacation. 
The priest was terrible at presiding and preaching. The music was awful. I got nasty looks from people in the parish because I was in their pew, and I didn't feel welcome at all, and I walked away feeling even more deflated than when I went. And our response as Catholics should be, great. That means my Sunday worship was nothing about me and 100% about God. As I literally came to church, I got nothing out of it personally, but God got the glory. And it's actually good for us to experience this sometimes, of where we literally give something, but we get nothing in return. And it's okay. Because sometimes in justice, that's what's owed. Like, think about it, right? One hour of your week was miserable when God gave you seven days of 24 hours that were great. So the fact that one hour kind of stunk, it's actually kind of good. And again, this is why this virtue of justice and all the virtues kind of come alive in this illuminative phase. As we start to turn on the lights and we go, yeah, you know what? In order for me to be a just person, it can't always be about me. And so you see that, that key of humility in this virtue. Now, as you can see, these virtues build upon each other. And so without the virtue of prudence, it's going to be really hard to issue justice. If you can't think rightly and gather all these informations in this kind of data, it's hard to give a just decree. Also, the virtue of fortitude is if we lack the virtue of fortitude, it's going to be extremely hard that when, if there's an unjust situation, either to rebel against the tyranny or to rise up above the submissiveness to say someone's got to stand for these person's rights. And thus, the virtues so beautifully play with one another, so that as we have the ability to think rightly, the willpower and fortitude to actually convict us of things and to move rightly, then we have justice to know what is the right way to respond to every given situation and person.